Well, we're digging into the second half of Romans chapter 8 in the next couple of weeks. Uh, this section I called Living with the Hope of Glory. Chapter 8 began with those incredible words, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it, it really is a, a glorious reality that Jesus has paid for our sins even though we saw in the opening seven chapters of Romans that there's this ongoing struggle with sin. Chapter 7 spoke of Paul as a wretched man struggling with sin, and that is our ongoing reality. But because of Jesus, we don't stand condemned, and the Spirit within us enables us to put sin to death. And what we saw last time in the previous video was that we are now children of God children who are enabled to approach God as our Father, crying, Abba, Father. But then the previous section ended in verse 17 by saying, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. And what we see is that Paul moves from speaking primarily about the ongoing struggle with sin to in this section speaking about our ongoing struggle with suffering. And that's what we'll look at uh, in the next couple of videos. As always, I encourage you just to take some time to read through this passage yourself, uh, to familiarize yourself with it, spend some time praying, asking God to help you to understand His Word, and to open your eyes to see the wonder of what He's done for us through Jesus. And as always, I'm just going to highlight some of what I've seen in this passage. As I said, Paul is now talking a lot about our present suffering, the reality of suffering in this world. And he he speaks of creation suffering, being subject to frustration, uh, this bondage to decay, creation groaning. And then he speaks about, but not only creation, but we ourselves are also suffering. We are groaning inwardly. Uh, We are weak. The Spirit groans on our behalf. So this idea of of suffering is a key, big idea in this section. But in the face of the suffering, Paul speaks about uh, glory. And verse 18 frames the whole section. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now this is talking primarily about future glory that creation itself is waiting for. This passage, as you see it, it begins and ends by speaking of this glory because suffering is our present reality. It's suffering now, glory later. So Romans 8 gives no room for the the so-called health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that promises you your best life now. Life should be good for us as God's children. We have incredible hope. We stand, we're not condemned. We can cry out to our Father, as verse 15 says, Abba, Father. These are incredible things, but suffering is a present reality, and it will be an ongoing present reality. But our present suffering is not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. There are incredible things for us to look forward to. Now Paul begins by speaking about creation itself. And he says creation is waiting, eagerly waiting. Uh, This idea of eager waiting is, you see it here, creation waits in eager expectation. And then he speaks about us. We wait eagerly. Uh, We wait patiently. Now, this idea of the eager waiting is almost straining to see uh, the glory that's coming. And creation itself is waiting for that. Uh, The whole creation, we are told, is groaning as in the pains of childbirth. And built into this frustration and bondage to decay and groaning, though, there is hope. Because it's creation knows that it will be liberated. Uh, The pains of childbirth, we know, don't end in those pains. They they end in a child coming. Um, So there's hope built into um, this. And that's where we see in the hope that the creation itself will be liberated. And so hope is a, a big theme in these verses. 
And again, we see, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. This is a future hope. We aren't promised the best life now. But what we do have is we have the Spirit now. As we saw, it is the Spirit working in us. We saw in the early part of Romans, uh, helping us in our struggle against sin. It's the Spirit in us who testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, sons of God. And the Spirit um, is a down payment guaranteeing the glory that's coming. But we see here, we have the first fruits of the Spirit, but right now we groan inwardly. We are eagerly awaiting for our adoption to sonship. Now what Paul is talking about here is adoption in the final sense of that word, when our bodies will be redeemed and raised from the dead. So when we will be finally set free is the idea, the redemption of our bodies. So although there is no condemnation for us, our sins have been paid for, we have this ongoing struggle with sin, we have the present reality of suffering, and we're waiting for the day when our final adoption and our our bodies will be finally set free, when that will be a reality for us. And so our present reality is one of waiting. And that's something that we see in this passage, creation's waiting, we are waiting. We are to wait patiently. So the reality for us now is one of suffering, a suffering in which we eagerly wait, knowing that there is glory coming. But sometimes in our suffering, we we don't even know how to pray. And these verses just give us glorious hope where we see what the Spirit does in us and for us. Uh, sometimes we, we just can't find the words to pray. And what we may be able to say, as in verse 15, we might be able to cry out, Abba, Father, but in these sufferings, they're so intense that we can't say any more. And we are told here that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. This has the idea of uh, the Spirit almost rolling up his sleeves and stepping in to help us in our weakness. Uh, Almost as if the Spirit is saying, this suffering is too great for you to to carry on your own. Uh, Let me help you. It's a glorious idea. And we know that we we do not know what we ought to pray. Sometimes we just can't find the words to pray. But the Spirit himself testifies for us through wordless groans, or as the ESV says, groans too deep for words. And he who searches our hearts, so he knows us better than we know ourselves, It's talking about God who knows, searches our hearts. He knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people according to the will of God. So the Spirit prays just the right prayers. Uh, He intercedes for God's people. And so what we can take from this is sometimes when we don't know what to pray, it's almost as if the Spirit is saying, look, Father, this is, this is the prayer that your precious child would say right now if they could find the words. These are the words they'd want to say, and this is how they would say it. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Um, so we see here that we are children of God. Uh, throughout this section, Paul reminds us of this reality. We are children of God. We are, we've been adopted to, uh, to sons, but the final adoption's coming. We are God's people, brothers and sisters of Christ, and God is at work. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Uh, This is uh, one of those much cherished verses in the Bible. Paul has said here, we know that the whole creation is groaning. Um, And then he says, but we have this hope, and in the same way, just as we hope, for the glory that's coming. In the same way, the Spirit even helps us in our suffering, helping us to pray in the light of this hope that is ours. And then he says again, and we know that in all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Now, included in that all things is these sufferings. God is doing more in our sufferings than we can 
see with our own eyes. And Paul is saying we need to trust him. That God is working in all things for the good of those who love him. The ultimate good is the glory that will be revealed in us when we are glorified. But there's also good that God works in us right now. And that is to conform us to the image of his son. God is working in our sufferings to make us more like Jesus. Just as Jesus was a suffering servant king, so we will also face suffering. And as we face that suffering, the good that God is working is to conform us to the image of his son. He's making us more like Jesus. And as we walk this journey as God's foreknown, predestined children, we have been called. That is the effectual calling of the, the gospel when we realized how sinful we were and our need for a savior and when God opened our eyes to see Jesus so that now we stand not condemned. We've been called, we've been justified, no condemnation. And those he justified, he's also glorified us, past tense. It's as good as it's already been done. So it's God who has foreknown us, predestined us, called us, justified us. He's already done a good work in us. He will most certainly finish the work that he's begun. And so we can say, I consider that our present sufferings, whatever those might be for you or for those who are hearing uh, the teaching that you're giving on this passage, whatever those present sufferings are, they're not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. As God's children who have been conformed to the image of his son, one day we will be with him in glory. This is the hope that we have. And right now, God is working in all things for our good and for his glory that we might one day be with him in glory. This is an incredible passage for us to be digging into And I trust that it will thrill your heart. We have this glorious hope. And our future hope determines our present choices. It determines how we live in the present. As God's children, our hope of glory, which is rooted in the past, foreknown and predestined, it is secure in the future. We will be glorified. It shapes the way that we face every circumstance of our lives. And so as you dig into this passage further, I pray that uh, God would use it mightily uh, for our good, for your good, for his glory. Well, God bless as you dig in. Mm -hmm.